Christmas, happy holidays, happy Kwanzaa to you all, and welcome to National Action Network Saturday Action Rally. It is our special rally today because, of course, it is Christmas. So, Merry Christmas, hello, and welcome to the National Action Network Saturday Action Rally. We're coming to you live on WLIB, 1190 AM in New York. We're streaming to you across the country on a number of platforms, including Facebook and nationalactionnetwork.net. We are live right here in the House of Justice, 106 West 145th Street. Call somebody. Call a reindeer. Tell them the action is on the air. The Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton is in the house and getting ready to come to you. We're so pleased that we, you are with us on this Saturday morning because if you hear the cry of no justice, no peace, you know this is where the action is. Our president and founder is the Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton. The chairman of our board is the Reverend Dr. W. Franklin Richardson, senior pastor of Grace Baptist Church in Mount Vernon, New York. I'm attorney Michael Hardy. We'll be with you throughout the broadcast. We are so, so pleased today to have for our inspirational word segment, the Reverend Dr. Malcolm Byrd. He's a pastor at Mother AME Zion Church in the great village of Harlem. I should say the historic Mother AME Zion Church right here in the village of Harlem. Of course, if it's Saturday, our musical director, Minister Tyrone Richardson is in the house along with the Change Choir. And of course, if it's Saturday, our sister and liaison to President Sharpton will be here to ask you, what's on your mind? That's right. She wants to know what you're thinking about, whether you called Santa, whether you called anybody. You should have called Katrina to tell her what's on your mind. If you've not had an opportunity to call, you can still call Katrina and tell her what's on your mind, 877-626-4651, or you can email Katrina at what's on your mind at nationalactionnetwork.net. And of course, the Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton is in the house and getting ready for you. So you want to call somebody, tell them the action is on the air. The Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton is in the house and getting ready for you. We always remind you that the NAN Youth Huddle will meet on Monday, December 26th, live right here at the House of Justice Auditorium beginning at 6 p.m. <clears throat> Spread the word and get into the action with our youngest and brightest dreamers of today and leaders of tomorrow. For more information on the Youth Huddle, you can call us at 877-626-4651, 877-626-4651, or email nanyouthhuddle, all spelled out, at gmail.com. We also are inviting everyone that is of interest, please join the NAN Second Chance Committee Advocates, Faith and Community Members on Tuesday, January 17th next year, uh, coming up real soon for an Albany Advocacy Day meet and greet with legislators and urge them to pass the Clean Slate Act, this legislative session. Clean Slate will, see, will seal and expunge criminal records of those who are eligible and have had con and have had no contact with the criminal legal system to sign up after the rally. Victor Pate of the Second Chance Committee will be in the rear of the auditorium with a sign-up sheet today only. So you want to make sure that you are on it or if you're not here, can't make it, make sure you call your friend and tell them to put your name on the list with Victor Pate. Of course, we always remind you to tune in to MSNBC's Politics Nation 
with Al Sharpton today at 5 p.m. Saturday and tomorrow Sunday at 5 p.m. Tune in to Politics Nation on MSNBC with Al Sharpton. But right now, brothers and sisters, to continue the joy and cheer today is Dr. Alvin Ponder, Vice President of the New York uh, City Chapter. Thank you, Attorney Hardy. Good morning, brothers and sisters, and listeners and viewers, and thank you for tuning in to another Saturday Action Rally with the National Action Network. Here's some information to keep you in the know. Nan to bring Christmas cheer to those in need. The National Action Network and Reverend Al Sharpton will host several New York City and state elected officials today, Saturday to December 24th, for the annual Christmas dinner and toy distribution right here at the House of Justice in Harlem, immediately after the weekly rally. The House of Justice is located at 106 West 145th Street. 145th and Lennox. Among those scheduled to attend is the U.S. Senator Kristen Gillibrand. This will be the first time since the COVID-19 pandemic that NAN will host in-person dining for Christmas. Thanksgiving marked the first time since 2019 that dining was held within the House of Justice as NAN distributed package to go meals in 2020 and 2021 at this site. Now the NAN community will be able to reconvene for the holiday season as we prepare for the work ahead in this coming year, 2023. Now in Atlanta, the NAN chapter will distribute toys from our Atlanta office. For more information, contact the NAN Atlanta office at 678-732-0405. Those in Atlanta, again, that number is 678-732-0405. NAN praises the Department of Justice stance on drug sentencing policies. Reverend Al Sharpton applauded the U.S. Department of Justice's decision to end racially motivated sentencing policies in an announcement that was made last week. Reverend Sharpton said, quote, as one who led marches in the 1990s about this unfair and racially tinged decision to prosecute and sentence people differently between crack cocaine and loose cocaine, I was more than pleased when I was informed by the Justice Department that they will no longer use those procedures. Reverend Sharpton added that this was not only a major prosecutory and toral and sentencing decision, it is a major civil rights decision. The racial disparities of this policy have ruined homes and futures for over a generation. I salute Attorney General Mary Garland for taking this major step towards equality and fairness. Loudmouth. Haven't seen Loudmouth yet? is the documentary in movie theaters that chronicles the life and activism of Reverend Al Sharpton. Now you go ahead and check and see if the documentary is playing at a theater near you. You can log on to our website at www.nationalactionnetwork.net. Preparing for King Day 2023. 2023 will mark the 55th year since the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. It will also mark the 60th anniversary of the historic March on Washington in 1963, where Dr. King delivered that famous I Have a Dream speech. Now more than ever, during the most challenging time in our nation, we must remember and protect Dr. King's threatened legacy Founded in the spirit and tradition of Dr. King's principles, the National Action Network is proud to be the legacy organization of Dr. King. On this day, January 16th, next year, 2023, NAN encourages elected officials, community activists, clergy, and leaders across the country to pause and remember the example of Dr. King and the importance of his work. Our annual King Day events 
not only celebrates Dr. King's legacy, but also provides an opportunity to refocus on the work we each do to advance his dream. NAM will host his annual public policy forum at the House of Justice in Harlem in the afternoon of January 16th. Early in the day, there will be a King Day breakfast down in Washington, D.C. NAD chapters across the nation will also host events to commemorate America's moral and social justice leader. Leaders gather to stand against racism and anti-Semitism. Quote, to take an active stand against the increasing instances of racism and anti-Semitism in our country, Mayor Eric Adams, Reverend Al Sharpton, founder, chairman and CEO of Vista Equity Partners and the chairman of Carnegie Hall, Robert F. Smith, founder and CEO of the World Values Network, Rabbi Shmuley Boteyed, and Elisha Beasel came together to host 15 Days of Light, celebrating Hanukkah and Kwanzaa in a unifying holiday ceremony on Sunday, December 18th, at Carnegie Hall in New York City, reported the Jewish News Syndicate. Reverend Sharpton said that there's never a time more needed than now for blacks and Jews to remember the struggle we've gone through. You can't fight for anybody if you don't fight for everybody. I cannot fight for black rights if I don't fight for Jewish rights and other rights, because then it becomes a matter of self-aggrandizement rather than fighting for humanity. It's easy for blacks to stand up for racism. It's easy for Jews to stand up for anti-Semitism. But if you want to be a leader, you got to speak as a black against anti-Semitism and anti-Semites. And you got to speak as a Jew against racism, said Reverend Sharp. Clean Slate Advocacy Day. Now, this was earlier reported. Please join the NAN Second Chance Committee along with advocates, faith leaders, and community members on Tuesday, January 17th, 2023. Tuesday, January 17th, 2023 for an Albany Advocacy Day to meet with the legislators and urge them to pass the Clean Slate Act during this coming legislative session. Now, as explained, the Clean Slate Act will seal and or expunge previous criminal records of those that are eligible and have had contact with the criminal legal system. The sign up after the rally, Victor Pate of the uh, Second Chance Committee, will be in the rear of the auditorium with a sign-up sheet. Let's all participate. Welcome to all of you who have tuned in and joined us also via live stream at www.nationalactionnetwork.net and also live on Facebook at The National Action Network. If this is your first time joining us and or if you're not a member of NAM, we welcome you to NAM and invite you to join us and get to the action today. For more information and to join, you may visit, again, that's www.nationalactionnetwork.net, or you can just call 877-626-4651. Again, that's 877-626-4651, or just text the word NAN, N-A-N, to 597-69. Welcome. All right, thank you, Dr. Alvin Ponda. You know, Marvin Gaye says, what's going on? Katrina Jefferson says, what's on your mind? And she is here to ask you, what's on your mind? Sister Katrina Jefferson, the liaison to President Sharpton and coordinator of all things at the House of Justice. Good morning. Good 
morning, Attorney Hardy, and good morning to each and every one of you who are here with us live here at the House of Justice, to those that are watching by way of live streaming on our Facebook platforms and our website, uh, www.nationalactionnetwork.net, and to those that are listening by way of WLIB 1190 AM, welcome to another weekend's conversation of What's On Your Mind, where you, the community, you, the people, have the opportunity to interact with the National Action Network by sending us your thoughts, your viewpoints. Maybe it's a conversation you overheard as you were commuting this week. Well, guess what? We love to hear from you. You can email us at whatsonyourmind at nationalactionnetwork.net. Again, that email address is whatsonyourmind at nationalactionnetwork.net. Or you may call us at 877-626-4651. We are going to start this weekend's conversation with feedback from one of our dear mothers. If this gentleman would take a seat. Thank you kindly. Good morning. Give us your name. Let us know where you're from and share with us what's on your mind. Good morning, and greetings. This is mother. I want to, I just want to tell you the something. Just want to tell you that I love you. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to tell you that, that I am so thankful for your support and for putting up with me. And if I could say, I would be like my Ella Jackson did. Tell me who could ask for anything more. Tyler told me that. He said, that's all right, Mama. You, you don't have to worry about the property. Thank you, Stan. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, brother. I love our season, Stan, to the call, a lifetime member here, and certainly a warrior that's been on the front line fighting for justice. Good morning. Uh, give us your name. Let us know where you're from. And today, we're going to, I'm going to pose a question to everybody that I want you to answer uh, during your segment. So here's what you're answering if you're standing in line. What is one thing that you are grateful for this year? Good day, everybody, and God bless everybody. My name is Sister Reverend Word. I'm from Heaven Lord in Harlem, and I'm 71 years old and new. This question is very appropriate because it matches what I was really going to be um, talking to you all about. But I am really grateful for God answering my prayer. I have many prayers, but one in particular that I want to really extend and share with you all is I've always wanted to be part of a community that really is helpful, that really is blessed by God to do the will of God on this earth in the level of civil rights. We are fortunate to be um, given an opportunity to join the National Action Network, and for me, that's a prayer answered. Today is a very joyous day. We're giving out toys and food, and I'm really grateful to God for answering my prayer, and I hope that many of you all have the same prayer on that level, and consider joining National Action Network. Good day, God bless you all, and Merry Christmas. Amen. Good morning. Give us your name. Let us know where you're from and tell us what are you grateful for this year. Good morning. I'm from the Bronx, Sandra Edson. I'm grateful that God has woke us up and let the breath stay in our bodies because other people have passed on. And I thank God for the national action of just to the house of this house, of his leadership of Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton. God bless everybody. Good morning. Give us your name. Let us know where you're from and share with us what's on your mind. Good morning. I'm Reverend Goddess Kennedy, and we were the National Action Network from the beginning. And I am so grateful and thankful to be alive, thankful for all that has happened that we're able to do this again. Because the last time we did it was in 2018. Yeah. So to be able to be here be alive at 84 years of age. Oh <laughs> and, uh, I introduced the Christmas Elf in 2017. So 2018 was the last time we did it, and I was the Christmas Elf. So today, I'm the Christmas Elf again. I'm grateful for the 84 years. I'm grateful for, especially for you and that precious baby. I'm so grateful for Do Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton and the National Action Network family. Thank you so much. And I'm going to close out with what I am grateful for, which is 
our volunteer team here at National Action Network. We, uh, yes, that does deserve a clap. Uh, for those that are watching or listening, and certainly those that are here in the house, our volunteer team is what supports the work that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. We wouldn't be able to do the holiday programs if we didn't have the volunteers here to support. So for those that came out to help set up and those who helped uh, set up the toys and those that are here today or in transit uh, to be a part of our Christmas celebration, I am grateful for your service. Um, not only today, but certainly throughout the year. And I encourage all of you, if you are listening or watching or here in the house and you want to become a part of our volunteer team here at NAN, please see me immediately following the rally. I'd love to get your information and get you plugged in to the action here today. And if you are watching or listening, you can call us at 877-626-4651 and leave a message for Katrina. And that concludes this weekend's conversation of what's on your mind. Keep in mind that the, everything that you've heard today were simply the thoughts and the viewpoints of those that contribute and do not reflect those of the National Action Network directly. And you can interact with us, engage with us, be one with us 24 hours a day by emailing us at what's on your mind at nationalactionnetwork.net. Again, that email address is what's on your mind at nationalactionnetwork.net. Or you may call us at 877-626-4651. Back to you, Attorney Harvey, and happy holidays. All right. Thank you, Katrina Jefferson, for what's on your mind. Brothers and sisters, you know our musical director is in the house. He's also the leader of the Change Choir. We're going to have our soloist, Tisha Hunter, come right now. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Does anybody have any joy this morning? Come on, come on. Merry Christmas to everybody, and I pray that you have love and peace in your life.
Letitia Hunter, that's our soloist, a member of the Change Choir, of course, all under the direction of our musical director, Minister Tyrone Richardson. Right now, brothers and sisters, we're going to go in the house, and this morning, Gina Williams, chairperson of the Education Committee, will bring us in the house. Coming in the house, of course, is all about the work of the committees here, the National Action Network, and... Our education committee is coming right now, Gina Williams. Thank you, Attorney Hardy. Thank you all. Welcome, Nan. Good morning. On this Christmas Eve morning, our founder and president, Reverend Al Sharpton, courageously and fearlessly continues the right frill, joyful fight through psychoeconomical psycho racial educational, civil rights justice, creating a space and an opportunity for all to get involved in this national action movement. District 5, New York City Public Schools, underneath the leadership of our super superintendent, Dr. Sean Davenport, and his team are on an upward swing of success with the House of Mecca for our children of color reminding collective partners this is who we are harlem family where failure is not an option only outcomes of goal oriented successful measures are the road traveled d5 working with collaborative partnerships navigating through collaborative framework especially regarding black studies curriculum d5 Schools now, the attendance is steady, increasing almost at 90%, the highest improved attendance with goal opportunities to go to 100%. The District Attendance Action Committee developed a district coaching strategy, tier success for support base, attendance rate, chronic absenteeism rate, and subgroup data. Now, how are they doing this work? This is going to be through communication nudges, emails, phone calls, newsletters, virtual check-ins and trainings, communicating with parent coordinators. And if you see a child they're on the street and you know that they have to be to school by 8.30, village, village, please, I'm encouraging you, stand up, check in, encourage them with that nudge to get to school on time. Our CEC 5 monthly meeting, which occurred on Wednesday, December 21st, we had the School of Construction there, talking about the five-year capital plan. This is very important because this is where all the money is coming. Their mission is to design, construct a safe, attractive, environmental safe space for children throughout many communities of New York City. School of Construction is dedicated to build and modernize schools in a responsible, cost-effective manner while achieving higher standards of excellence, safety, quality, and integrity. Citywide highlights, though, $20.1 billion are being spent on capacity, accessibility, electrification, technology. They're going to be doing TC removals and playground improvements. The capacity budget, $8.75 billion. New capacity replacement programs, class size reduction, early education. District 5 in 2023 will open the Black Association Daycare located at 110 West 146th Street, occupying 100 seats. That's right around the corner from our House of Justice. And our subcommittee, we will be joining them underneath the leadership of Brenda Ricketts to follow up with our reading involvement of literacy to upmold mobility for success. The mandated programs are going to be in a description of accessibility for Orient auditoriums, broiler construction, cafeteria, the kitchen areas, climate control, domestic piping, exterior masonry, windows, playgrounds, roofing, the pallet parts that do the ceiling to secure that children have a healthy environment since this is a high rate asthma control 
uh, population in which we're living. Now, a lot of question is, how is this capital plan, plan happening? Well, that is a very complicated question, and it has a strategic answer. This is a collective, collaborative, community route. So it involves citywide initiatives. The funding is coming from elected officials. The problems are coming from the school facilities and the emergency issues to be addressed. The building consideration of assessment surveys. Now, people would like to know, what is a resolution, Reso 8 project? Well, it's school specific on capital improvement. It enhances the projects that are funded by individual grants from New York City council members or borough presidents. These projects are important to the school community because they help the Department of Education to enhance the facilities in the existing school building. Once a city council member or borough president decides and designates the grant money, the School of Construction is responsible for scoping out the project and overseeing the design and the construction for a safe space. Reso 8A is allocated projects from 2015 to current. There are 28 Reso 8 projects right now funded for $7 million. So libraries, one. Playgrounds, science labs, that's STEM programs to elevate our children to a higher level. More importantly, the School of Construction Authority is dedicated to increasing the participation of minority-owned and locally-based businesses. Enterprise on School of Construction Authority, in addition to mentoring programs, which provides key support assess to capital and business opportunities for qualified emergency of minority black women. So I encourage you, you have a thought, you have an idea, you have a program, it's gonna help our children elevate. You are a woman of color, bring it to the Department of Education, become a vendor and get involved in this process. It takes all of us in this village. The School of Construction also has a program for high school students, 10th and then college students as well. And they are training to get involved to learn about the construction and how it begins because not everyone is going to college, but however, there are other opportunities for them to succeed. And we should explore those opportunities. But as the NAN Education Committee is working diligently, bringing speakers to the NAN stage for our community to inspire and empower success for all, I encourage you to please get involved and be at the table in these meeting rooms. I also want to highlight Reverend Al Sharpton is very encouraging and motivating and he is asking us to be supportive to our education trinity. What is that? That would be Mayor Adams, Chancellor Banks, all the superintendents, but I'm in particular to my super superintendent, Dr. Sean Davenport. I thank you for your time and attention, and I encourage you to get involved in our NAN Education Committee and other committees as we collaborate. Thank you. All right, thank you, Gina Williams, for that report. Right now, brothers and sisters, once again, our musical director, Minister Tyrone Richardson, along with the ensemble.
That was Minister Tyrone Richardson and the Change Ensemble. Right now, brothers and sisters, we're going to get a report from the crisis team right here. Derek Perkinson, the crisis director, is going to come and talk about that work. That's the heart and soul of National Action Network. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, National Action Network. Good morning, Nan. First off, I'd like to say thank you, Nan family. Thank you to our president and founder, Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton, and attorney Michael Hardy, Nan staff, Nan membership, and our wonderful, hardworking Nan volunteers. Our Crisis Nan Steering Committee meets every Friday, and we will reconvene on Friday, January 6th, from 11.30 to 1 p.m. via Zoom. If you're interested uh, in joining the Crisis Committee, please join. Um, we gather on this call to discuss the tough crisis cases and pool our collective resources uh, to assist as best Nan can. We always are open to having assistance and serving, so please join today, 877-626-4651. In the months of November and December, some of the Nan crisis calls have been from Jackson, Mississippi. Akila Lewis, the mother of Jalen Lewis, 25-year-old son, was shot and killed by Capitol State Police in Jackson, Mississippi. The fourth such shooting involving the Capitol Police in Jackson, Mississippi, and the first shooting resulting in death. Jalen was shot during an encounter Sunday night with officers in Miss Mississippi's Capitol Police Force. The family claims Jalen was being followed in an unmarked police car with heavily tinted windows. They further claim that the police never identified themselves nor gave Jaden time to do anything. The family is looking to see the autopsy report and to retain attorney Lee Merritt. The Capitol Police is a unit of the Mississippi Department of Public Safety, the state agency that oversees law enforcement. At a community meeting, Pastor Dwayne Pickett said Lewis was close friends with one of his sons. Pickett said he spoke to an officer who was at the scene of the shooting. He also spoke to a man who was in the car with Lewis. Pickett said he was told Lewis was shot in the head through the windshield of a car. The pastor, who said he is supportive of police officers, referred to the Capitol Police as a cowboy type group of guys that were hired from a neighboring county. Some of these officers were rejected from other places. It's a vigilante group and there's open season on our people. The Capitol Police Department became an entity of the Mississippi Department of Public Safety in 2021. The goal here is to create a safer capital city, says Sean Tidell, the Public Safety Commissioner at the time. The force initially paroled areas around the state capitol buildings. It expanded to patrol some other neighborhoods near downtown Jackson. The family is requesting Nan help to get the word out and to seek justice for Jalen Lewis. In some unfortunate news right here in Harlem, the Nan Crisis Department received a call from the family of Harlem, New York, Elijah Irving, aka Sugar Hill drill rapper E. Baby, who passed away allegedly from a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. He was 17. In Patterson, New Jersey, E. Dot was transported to a nearby hospital here in Harlem, where he was pronounced dead upon arrival. The Harlem rapper is known for being one of the forefathers of drill rap in Harlem when drill rap from Brooklyn first took over the city in the late 2010. During 2020, he was 15 years old in the center of all things with drill rap in Uptown to open doors for B-Love, K-Flop, Ice Spice, and even D.D. Osama before his Drake cosign. In the weeks leading up to this one, E-Dot had just inked a deal with the major label, moved out of the hood, and was planning to drop music with the machine behind him. Police has ruled this case as a suicide and say the case is closed. However, Mr. Irvin's family feels the police are not properly doing their job because Mr. Irvin was a drill rapper. Mr. Irvin's family feels his death was not a suicide, and Mr. Irvin's girlfriend played a part in his passing. The 22-year-old girlfriend in the apartment at the time of his shooting, um, the family alleges the girlfriend tampered with the crime scene, most notably by moving the weapon used in the commission of Mr. Irvin's passing. No arrest has been made. Currently, the family is in the process of securing an attorney, and we will stand with them as the family seeks justice for Irvin, Elijah Irvin. Nan also received a call from Memphis, Tennessee. Ms. Felicia Young received a call from a detective stating that her son, Pedarius Sanders, 27, was hit and killed by a car walking alone on the interstate. Mrs. Young is claiming she is not being allowed to see her son's body. She is also claiming the police would not let her see the autopsy report, nor the body cam footage. States that she's not getting, she's getting the runaround. 
She says that when the family saw the body, the injuries was inconsistent with someone that was beat. It was consistent with someone that was beaten, eyes swollen and everything. Also states that before he was allegedly killed, she received a call from a Caucasian woman that stated she was concerned that something was going to happen to him. Police have been reluctant to pull a body cam. Autopsy report is pending. Incident that happened October 13th. Seeking legal assistance, Nan is assisting to help to secure the autopsy report and possibly the body cam footage. And we also got a call from Lafayette, North Carolina. Miss Bennett, the son, her son was killed in, in March of 2020. There was a fight. Initially, they said it was a homicide. Now they were saying it was a suicide. The house where the son was attending a party was the home of a family member of the chief of police. They're seeking advocacy as we speak. In Spartanburg, South Carolina, Miss Beverly Reese, her son has mental illness was walking in the middle of the road, was picked up by the police, was taken into the detention center, 24 hours later he was found dead. Has not gotten any information on cause of death. We're working on these and many more cases. If you'd like to volunteer, help us. 877-626-4651. Thank you. All right, thank you. Derek Perkinson, the crisis director here at National Action Network. Brothers and sisters, we are so pleased to have today for our inspirational word, Reverend Dr. Malcolm Bird, pastor of Mother AME Zion Church in the village of Harlem. Let's welcome. Good morning, Nan family, and Merry Christmas to all of you who are here present and perhaps those of you who are viewing today. Our fearless leader and founder, the Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton a few weeks ago was named to city and county, city and state magazines publication of the 100 most influential and powerful religious leaders in the state of New York. Our founder was not only named to that 100 list, but he is number one on that 100 list. I am number 84 on that 100 list. So that tells me I got a little work to do. Uh, would you believe, dear friends, that there are Republican leaders around this country who do not believe it is the federal government's place or is the place of local municipalities to do anything about issues centering around housing insecurity. They believe wholeheartedly that it's up to the individual to secure housing for themselves. They don't want the government interfering with ensuring that people have access to quality places to live. They are not interested in being sanctuary cities, providing place for persons to have even temporary domicile uh, anywhere near them. And most of these Republican and conservative leaders consider themselves bona fide Christians. They are Bible-toting and Bible-thumping. They attend Sunday school. They can quote the sermons of Billy Graham and other uh, conservative religious leaders and preachers. But if they ever opened up the Bible they tote and thump, they will note that central to the theme of Christmas morning is a unique instant of housing insecurity. Yeah. Uh, if you were to search the Christmas morning narrative in Luke's Gospel, the second chapter, you will note that the innkeeper said to them, I don't have any room for you. My, my place is full, I'm filled to capacity, and even if I have had the room, you all don't look like you could afford the rooms that I have. But there is a place out back. 
It's not much. It's not even suitable for human habitation, but I do have room in back. If you can handle the smell of stable animals, if you can handle sleeping upon straw, I do have a place out back for you. Uh, and it appears as if this woman that you're with, she appears to be great with child. So if I were you, I would get back to that place as quickly as you possibly can. I know you're wondering where I'm going with this on this morning, but I'm here to tell you if you are here this morning and you have experienced housing insecurity at any point in your life, you know what Mary and Joseph were experiencing on that Christmas morning. It's a terrible state to be in to not know if you have a place to lay your head. And that's why the work of the National Action Network is not just holiday work, but it's everyday work because every person deserves a place to lay their head. And here we are on this Christmas Eve as we are approaching Christmas. What is so unique and significant for marginalized people when we do an assessment of the Christmas story? And here is what makes it so unique. Here is why it's so special for us. Not just because there's garland and there's a tree and there are wreaths and perhaps there's a Christmas gumbo brewing on somebody's stove right now, but here is why Christmas is important to marginalized people. Jesus did not enter this world through the Plaza Hotel or through the Waldorf Astoria. Jesus entered into human space through an insecure space. Jesus himself was housing insecure. And that's why when I pray to him about my brothers and sisters who are experiencing housing insecurity, I can talk to Jesus about it because Jesus already knows. He's been there before. And as I take my final 30 seconds, as I take my seat on this Christmas Eve, if you're here this morning and you're wondering what's going to be under your tree on tomorrow, if you're here today and you know your money's been acting funny and Christmas tomorrow may not be what you want it to be, let me encourage you to do an assessment of what you have right now. And when you do an assessment, assessment of what you have right now, you will acknowledge that even if you don't see Christmas morning, you can have a Christmas spirit right now. Thank God for giving me a place to lay my head. Thank God for putting food on my table. Thank God if though it's eight and nine and ten degrees outside, I can sit in a warm space with the National Action Network right now. I can thank God and have a Christmas spirit every day of my life. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let us receive her King. Dr. Malcolm Bird, pastor of Mother AME Zion Church in the village of Harlem. Brothers and sisters, just want to give you a quick note in the loving memory of Margaret Lamb, a dear sister of National Action Network, lifetime member who recently moved on in celebration of Kwanzaa, joined the National Action Network, New York City chapter, political action, arts and culture committee, celebrating Kaumba creativity come out and celebrate our family, community, and culture here at the House of Justice, 106 West 145th Street, Saturday, December 31st, 12 to 4 p.m. There's also a book drive by the Education Committee, Bring Fruits or Nuts to Share, 
Owen Rogers Men's Auxiliary. Right now, brothers and sisters, I want you to get on your feet because I'm bringing to you the president and founder of the National Action Network, the Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton. Central Park. They were all under the duress of those that arrested them, that wanted to pin the vicious rape and vicious beating, unexcusable, on those black and brown kids that were available in the be scapegoats. And they coerced them into making statements that were to their detriment. And they were castigated. They were, in many ways, uh, totally castigated by the media. Sentenced, put in jail. There was a businessman in New York that bought ads out in the newspaper <laughs> saying that they should be executed they should reach or be given the death penalty. 33 years later, after they were exonerated, after Corey Weiss did the most time, 14 years, who's here this morning. This week, this week they changed the gate going to Central Park after the exonerated, named it after the exonerated five. And this week, the same week, the current wife and the other four got the gate. They executed the referral from the Congress to the Justice Department 
to bring criminal charges against the guy that bought the ad against them 30 years ago. Same week that he went at the Central Park Five and called for execution is the same week the January 6th committee executed a criminal referral on Donald Trump. When I looked this morning at Kerry Weiss, who never gave up, who never stopped saying he didn't do it. And I look at his four friends that, that were also incarcerated, not as long, but wrongly accused. When I look at the families, his mother that stood by him, if you don't give up, if you don't give out, your change will come. But I come to tell you that I've been through storm. Yes. I've been through trials and tribulations. Yes. I've been through Christmases that mama had to scrub floors and even give us a Christmas gift. Yes. But today, yes. mama don't scrub floor. Mama been gone, but her son yes. will stand with other sons and daughters to give gifts to children yes. and to give food to hungry. If you just hold on, God will turn your curses into blessings, make your downs turn into ups, go through the valley and head to the mountain tops. Your change will come. Your change. Change Choir, give them a big hand, give them a big hand. Certainly we're happy to be with you another Saturday morning for the Saturday Action Rally for you that are here in the House of Justice, 106 West 145th Street in the Village of Harlem. And for you that are listening to us on our various media platforms, we're happy to be with you another Saturday morning to give our report on where the action is. Give a hand to our presider, Attorney Michael Hardy, our minister of music, our musical director, Minister Tyrone Richardson. Give brother Chris and our guitarist also some. And certainly didn't we enjoy that inspirational message, yes. Reverend Dr. Malcolm yes. Bird. And uh, Malcolm Bird certainly pastors uh, the Mother A.M.E. Zion Church here in Harlem, a historic church. And uh, I want Paul Roberson and, and others were faithful members of that church. One, one of the reasons that we are struggling and uh, working so hard to establish a civil rights museum in Harlem 
people walk by history every day and don't know what they're walking by. It, it, it seems really, uh, to me, empty uh, for people to quote Paul Robeson and don't know the church he was attending right here in Harlem. That's right. That's right. Talk about uh, uh, Marcus Garvey and don't know where Liberty Hall was. Right. Talk about uh, Malcolm and don't know where the Audubon is. We should not take our history for granted because it's our story. And if we don't tell our story, who's going to tell it? No other group is deficient in telling their story. I'm say that real slow, but a lot of folk don't get that. We get je jealous and mad of other groups when we ought to try and be as proud of ourselves as people are them. I'm not mad at folks celebrating their story. I'm mad at us for not celebrating our story. People talk, well, all they talk about is them. They got their own little community. Well, we ought to be having our own little community talking about ourselves. And that is a part of one of the real missions that uh, that we have. That's why I'm glad in the, in, the, in 2023 we're going to be even working more closely with some of the historic churches and uh, uh, Malcolm Byrd and others because part of the story, people don't understand that part of the story of the black church is the story of how black folks made it. That's right. And, and that is why it is important. Uh, I was talking last week to you about how we was down at the National Conference of Na uh, the Conference of National Black Churches, and uh, one of the reasons that is important is all of our movements and all of our businesses and and schools and all started in the black church. So now. There, 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 to me, is a real effort to destabilize the appreciation of the black church because if they get you off of that, they can then destabilize the community. That's right. Listen. Now, that sounds like a, a, a self-serving statement, but it's not. Because the fact of the matter is that, and let's welcome our Impact Television family all over the country. If coming out of slavery, you got to really understand this. If coming out of slavery, that's all we had. And out of that, we grew into what it, we became. Then if they can cut you off from the root, then the fruit dies. And what we have seen, the methodical removal of our community. This is real important for y'all to get through these holidays. Y'all need to be thinking about stuff during holidays. Mm -hmm. If they can take your movements out of structures and institutions you own, I'm talking about your social mm -hmm. and your political movement, your social justice political movement, out of structures you own, then others that own it will decide your political and social justice agenda. Listen. So as long as they decide it, then the case of Bernard Prasad in, in uh, Inglewood is not deemed as important because they didn't decide that. Mm -hmm. How come some things are considered news and others are not. Why is some things important and others are not? Is who's in charge? Who tells the story? Y'all let them see the documentary on me, Loudmouth. We start with talking about the hunter and the lion. If the lion told the story, the hunter wouldn't be the victim. We've allowed them to take the black church and remove it from the social and political movements of our country and allowed some self-described folks Listen. who call themselves progressive to decide what is important to us. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Same 
anything they've done in the music business. We've gone from the music in our community, controlled by black music companies, Motown, Stax, Gambling Hub, Philly International, radio stations owned by us, all that gone. And now the big corporations own the record companies, the conglomerates own the radio stations. And that's why you done gone from Aretha singing respect to folk talking about calling you a hoe and a bee with a WAP. How you got here. If we grew up in the 60s where they were still fighting segregation in the South, but our song in our mind and in our heart was respect, was black and proud, was what's going on. Was change going to come? Yeah. It inspired us to drive toward liberation and freedom and civil and human rights. If you're raising your kids now, calling themselves the N-words and hoes and bees and WAP, and then you wonder what's wrong with the kids, you set them on a rhythm of self-destruction. <laughs> Because you are not in charge of what's put in your psyche. Gentrification is a result of the neutralization of our institutions. Everybody talking about gentrification. Well, where did it come from? They neutralize the pillars of our community. And if we don't deal with that, We'll never change this one. One, one, one of the tenets uh, of, of one of the last things Dr. King put in place was uh, he said we have to deal with the economic struggle. He said first we dealt with the uh, legal question of public accommodations. Then we dealt with the question of voting. He came north and he said, we got to deal with the economic struggle. Went to Chicago, dealt with open housing, and left a program, which was just a division of SELC, his organization, uh, called Operation Breadbasket. Jesse Jackson uh, was a staff member in Chicago. Fred Bennett was the head of the National in Atlanta. Later, Rim Jackson became the, pre the, the, the national director. The idea was that if you operate your community as a power base economically, everybody that does business in your community had to do business with you. So first thing we did, and I was youth director here in New York, first thing we did is if you had, a, at that time, the big supermarket change was A&P. Some of y'all old enough to remember A&P. <laughs> we said, well, if you're going to have stores in our community, well, you're going to have blacks on the board of A&P. You're going to have blacks having contracts to build your A&P supermarkets. You're going to have black lawyers you use. You're going to have black contractors. Mm -hmm. And you're going to put our magazines and newspapers on the shelf. Because we go shopping Red Bird and get to the counter, wasn't nothing there but Life Magazine, Look Magazine, People Magazine. What about Ebony and Jack? You in our community. And we started making them deal with economic accountability. Well, they wanted to cut all that off. And they created them what they called the new school kind of folk, trending folk. And it went from a &P to Walmart. And y'all ain't got none of them contracts and none of that that we fought for. They destabilized the institutions, telling you that, well, your father
fathers is old. That's yesterday. Don't listen to the old stuff. In fact, we don't even need the denominations now in the church. We don't need the Baptist Convention. We don't need the AME Zion Gathering. We don't need the AME and all that. We all unto ourselves. We a Mecca. We all by ourselves. We build our own big. We all a denomination each. We mega, mega churches with many mentalities, M-I-N-I. -I. When you had a string of independent denominations, you had the strength where presidents had to come to your convention. That's right. That's right. But when you started building your little independent self-glorification, you all became marginalized and your members started watching white evangelists and destroyed your base. That's why we built NAN to try to continue what King and, and Reverend Jackson and others was doing. That's why I don't need to worry about am I offending somebody when I stand up here and talk about what they did to, to, to Nolan uh, uh, Farrell Thomas, where no, uh, what they did to Reverend uh, Keith Gatson. I'm on these cases. They call us. We talk about. We get together after the holiday. We're gonna keep calling their name till we get together, cause they did to them what they did to the exonerated five. Nobody gonna shut us up. That's why Derek Ferguson was talking about when we deal with the crisis department. Why you need a crisis department, Reverend? They got assemblymen and councilmen and all of that. Because some of them don't respond. And we are a community in crisis. That's right. That's right. And you are claiming to be spiritual and holy, but not concerned about those in crisis. Nine degrees in New York. And you're not worried about human beings laying out in the street homeless, scared to go to a shelter, and you running from your car into your heated house, saved, sanctified, and not looking at people laying there in the street, hoping they don't get frostbit. Something wrong with your Holy Ghost. So that's why 12 o'clock today, we're going to feed the homeless and we're going to feed the seniors that don't have family here. We do it every Christmas. We do it on Christmas Eve out of respect to churches or meeting tomorrow. But they, they got to, uh, uh, inactive religion is no religion at all. Amen. You know, one of the stories Jesus told that is the most poignant story is he talked about how the man was robbed and beaten and laid by the side of the road. Someone of his same faith walked by and kept walking. Ignored him. Got on the other side of the street. So just like some of y'all. See homeless folk and cross the street. While you quote scriptures, you cross the street. While you speaking in tongues, you cross the street. While you humming your best hymn, you cross the street. Another man come well refined, well educated. But all of his studies didn't prepare him to have empathy and identity with those that was down. But then Jesus said another man came of a different race, different breed. But he stopped and helped him. He was the good Samaritan. If you want to celebrate Christ's birthday, be a good Samaritan and do something that makes you go out of your way. If I was coming to celebrate your birthday, I'd eat the food you like, I'd listen to the music you like. We're going to watch something on television, I'd watch what you like, because it's your birthday. That's right. Well, don't call this Jesus' birthday and not do what Jesus liked. Jesus.
Jesus didn't have sanctimonial, ceremonial things. Jesus fed the hungry. Jesus gave sight to the blind. Jesus lifted those that were downtrodden. If you're going to celebrate Christ's birthday, do what Christ would want you to do. Let me uh, say that a couple of things. One, I want to uh, join and thank uh, those that have worked and volunteered around the country as we of the last two weeks had dealt with Loudmouth, yeah. the documentary that has been now in 127 theaters. And uh, I, I thank I thank all of our chapters, yeah. all of those that have worked diligently and brought in a lot of new members. Uh -huh. And we're going to uh, continue. Then on January 13th, it was a little under three weeks away, it will go uh, the documentary Loud, Loud Mouth, The Life and Battles of Reverend Al Sharpton will be, uh, go live then on Apple TV yeah. and on Amazon. It'll be on there for the next several weeks, then Black History Month, two other networks picking up. So it'll be around for a long time. And I want to thank you that supported it. I also want to thank uh, uh, Brittany Grinder, who's out of Russian jail. And uh, gave a shout out to all of us that has uh, done uh, did the work in terms of keeping her plight very public. And, 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 and one of the things, in February, I'm going back to England. We're going to open up Nash Action Network London office. And one of, one of the things that uh, bothered me, I, I was reading this week, I had to jump in, is there's a guy on television there who's also a columnist named Jeremy uh, Clarkson. And uh, who said that he going to attack uh, Megan Marble, <coughs> Marco, uh, who uh, married the uh, prince, and said that she was a bunch of names. And then he went into the uh, uh, Game of Thorn, Thrones and said, I can't wait till they take her village to village naked and yell shame at all over England with all kind of racial and misogynist stuff. So, uh, of course, I attack that. We getting ready to go over there and deal with these kinds of attitudes. Let me also say this. I, I touched on it, and I want to break this down a little bit before I give you my Christmas message 22. Again, you that are uh, listening to us on uh, one of our media platforms, watching Impact. If you're near New York area, come and help serve at 12 noon. Uh, people here, we have uh, every year for 31 years, we uh, feed the homeless and seniors and we even eat our dinner here. Yeah. And uh, we usually do it on Christmas Day, but we're going to do it Christmas Eve because uh, we want to respect the church. Let me say the January 6th committee came out with his final report. Now, a lot of people just take the headline. I want y'all to really stop and think about it. They interviewed under oath, which means that you could be punished with perjury and go to jail. So people usually are very careful about what they say under oath. Mm -hmm. right. Under oath, you had one young lady who was the assistant, well, what was the was the head of the office of the chief of staff to the president. Chief of staff named Mark Meadows, his right hand lady said that she was there and heard Trump say, well, I don't want to be embarrassed, but he knew he lost. So this whole thing of them saying that this was a stolen election, 
they knew at the top they had lost and promoted this in the first place. Start right there. They raised on this stealing the vote, stealing the election, uh, this whole thing they started on social media, we was robbed. They raised over $250 million knowing that they lost the election. Which in and of itself, to raise money, knowing that the basis that you're raising it for is untrue, is a fraud. And raising from people that you have found to be gullible is something that is just as bad. Now, if people think that Trump is biased, which he is, think of what he thinks of his own supporters. If he would reach in their pocket to get them to finance something that he knows is a lie. So not only don't he have any respect for us, he don't have no respect for them. Secondly, they said that the groups that they knew were violent, Oath Keepers and others, were part of the organizing of January 6th. Thirdly, and, and this became very interesting to me, they said that they all were very unclear when took the fifth. Fit me, I, I, I won't answer that on the grounds that may incriminate me. When they were asking who financed the people getting to Washington on January 6th. Now, the reason I'm taking this step by step, I want you to follow this finance piece. National Action Network has in the last several years sponsored some of the largest marches in Washington. We did the 50th anniversary march with Martin Luther King III. We did the uh, march uh, in uh, 13. We did the march in uh, 2020 in the middle of George Floyd pandemic. 200,000 plus each time. Part of how we were able to do it is that we were able to get people buses from all over the country. Am I right? Some of y'all have ridden, uh, have rode on the buses from right here at the House of Justice to those marches. Every year, Attorney Hardy and our legal department files what they call a 990, which is public record on how you spend money. Every year. Part of the 990s is if we had to buy buses for this march or that march or whatever. Why is nobody demanding in the Congress, since the January 6th committee come out with this, is some people financed the buses that brought the insurrectionists to Washington? And why did they finance it? How many of y'all here in the House of Justice got on the bus rode with us to Washington? All right, now, y'all know Nan paid for the buses. But let me tell you something else you knew. You knew what time to be here. And you knew what time we were leaving to go back. Is that not right? And you knew the place of, the, of, of departure. Because if you didn't know the place of departure, you'd be left in Washington. Is that right? Okay, so let me go to January 6th. Somebody, unnamed, paid for the buses, brought them to Washington, to the Eclipse. How did they know they were going back from the Capitol building? I mean, who 
change the location of departure. And how, who knew what time they were going back? You see a whole lot of empty buses running around Washington looking for folk. This was an organized insurrection and a financed insurrection to overthrow an election. This country was that close to a bloodless coup d'etat. This country was that close. The reason why they chose January 6th, it wasn't the anniversary or nothing. It was the day to certify the election. And they had to stop the certification. And if they stopped it, just when it come out of January 6th, they wanted the vice president to then say, I can't certify it, it's too much fraud, which there was none. And therefore, Donald Trump remains president. Now, why are you laying all that out, Reverend? Because if you do not penalize and hold Donald Trump and them accountable for that, the overthrow of the government, the very tenets of what the country stands for, then you should have nobody in jail. That's right. If they can get away with that, then what the basis are you locking anybody up for anything? Because you make a mockery of the justice system. Well, you know, Rep, y'all ought to be careful how you talk. No, you ought to be careful how you don't talk. See, you, you know, you know I, I got folk always say to me, you know, I'll be careful. You know, some, some things, you, you, you can't go over the line. You can't press these guys. People got a lot of power. So do we. If we open up our mouth and talk to them. You know, a, a guy called me the other day on the radio and he said something that I like. He said that some of us got PTSD. PTSD, post-traumatic slave syndrome. <laughs> we still thinking like slaves. Well, we can't talk about that stuff, that, you know, that's for the masters to talk about. I, 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 I'm on MSNBC 5 o'clock every Saturday and Sunday, do more than Joe during the week. Well, you know, Red Mouth should leave that stuff alone. Just talk about Negro stuff. <laughs> they discuss in Ukraine. They don't say nothing about that. You, Zelensky and them, PTSD. You got slave syndrome. Well, what what Red Mount doing up in the White House arguing with Biden? Slave syndrome. Why are you talking about how they changed Jesus' birthday to the fourth quarter so corporations could make up their earnings for the year change? Nowhere in the Bible tell you that Jesus was born a week before New Year's. This was a corporate decision to turn a profit in the fourth quarter where they get you to go out and spend money that you don't have, running up your credit card on your bad credit. Slave syndrome. What you getting for Christmas? Nothing, it ain't your birthday. And we raise our children looking for gifts rather than working with them being gifted. And that's why 
We meet here on a weekly basis. That's why we're all over radio and television, trying to wake our people up to get back on track. Because everything that we achieved, we had to do it ourselves. Ain't nobody going to come for us and save us but us. You, you know, we have staff call all over, everybody on staff all over the country, our offices, different, LA, uh, Atlanta, Florida, all that, we, every Monday night. I talk to the whole staff. And one of the things that I stopped is, yeah, Reverend, they doing this to us here. Yeah, yeah, Reverend, they done took us. Oh, yeah, Reverend, they done pushed us out of Harlem. Oh, they did the same thing on South Side Chicago. Well, what are you doing about it? Yeah. I mean, you just setting up slave syndrome. You sit up talking about what they did. What are you doing to them? <laughs> That's why I'm talking about these black officials need to have a summit that I'm going to have in January. If you got all this power, then why are people pushing us around? We done put you in office. Now what are we going to do about it? And how come we're taking shots? Do you know how hard it was to get an Adrian Stewart Cousins to be the majority leader of New York State Senate? Carl Hayes to be the speaker? Or the assembly, as soon as they get there, people taking shots at them that are black. They never opened the, you had large judges when the other folks was there. <laughs> but now you got so much to say. Get in power and get beat down for being in power by your own because we have slave syndrome. That's what they used to do when we were enslaved. Yeah. Well, look at Mo. Mo got on a new clean shirt. Master gave him one of his shirts. And I still got the ragged undershirt I wear. And you mad at Mo for having one of the Master's throwaway shirts. And you still in your dirty undershirt. Rather than be mad at the Master that got you and Mo. <laughs> but that's a slave syndrome play you against each other you know they always talk about the crab in the barrel and how the crabs be crawling all over each other and that's what we do crabs every time one go up pull them down crabs that's your job. Black get a little position better than you. Mm -hmm. Who they think they are? Y'all get in the coffee clutch and start grabbing them, pulling them down. They don't know this about it. Crab mentality. But if the crabs had sense, the crabs would get together and push the lid off the barrel. And there'd be enough room for all the crabs. the business of organizing crabs. Let's get the lid up off of us. There's enough room for all of us. It is amazing to me. You know, I, I went and uh, spoke this week at uh, Robert Smith and, and uh, Rabbi Bate had a black Jewish uh, uh, Hanukkah into Kwanzaa and uh, showing that they are anti-Semitics out there attacking the Jews and they are racist attacking the blacks and uh, at Carnegie Hall. And I was telling them the one thing you got to understand, they've been writing a lot of stuff about Robert Smith and they always jumping on us, is that if you stand up, if you break your syndrome, they got to beat up on you to try to keep the other slaves in line. That's right. They gonna punish you for being successful because you stepped out of line. Because if they don't punish you, the others think they get free too. That's why when, when they hung blacks, 
that were runaway slaves, they would hang them in the square down in the middle of the village or the city because they wanted to make an example out of that black. They didn't go have private lynchings. They lynched them publicly. And folks that would go to church and sing hymns would then go to the square. They'd have food. Like they was having a picnic. Watching them hang a ex-slave that got out of line. And that's what they try to do with us all the time, and we become a part of it. And those that break out, I told them last week at Carnegie Hall, don't y'all ever forget, when they started, you know, they, they got these romanticized, sanitized stories about the civil rights movement. When Rosa Parks, who was an activist, who was a secretary in the NAACP, Rosa Parks, first of all, y'all need to stop them lies. That old woman got on the bus one day, she was just tired, weary, they asked her to move, and she was too tired, wouldn't move, got arrested, and that people got mad. No, no, no. Rosa Parks was not tired. And Rosa Parks was not wearing, Rosa Parks knew exactly what she was doing. It was not accidental, it was intentional. Because they wanted to confront the Jim Crow law. And she had the courage and the background and backing to stand up and do it. Now, when she did take the seat and they arrested her, and Gray, some of y'all watched Politics Nation a few weeks ago, I had Fred Gray on. Still alive, still functioning. And Fred Gray became a lawyer, Gwen Carr. They then met in Montgomery and said, now, what we need to do, again, they met, the churches met. Why did the churches meet? Because the churches are funded by their members. And there is nobody funding them that could tell them not to meet. That's right. That's right. One of the reasons why 31 years of National Action Network, we never take federal, state, or city money is because we are funded by what we do with fundraising activities and by our members. Mm -hmm. So can't nobody call us from the government and say, you out of your lines because you, you're supposed to follow the guidelines. And Eric Garner ain't in the guidelines. Mm -hmm. And, and yes, Freddie Gray ain't in the guidelines. Yes, and, and marching about second chance ain't in the guidelines. We determine the guidelines because we have what they call unrestricted funds. Problem you got now is too many of our churches are restricted. Which is why you need some unrestricted. Well, where you get that idea from, Chaplain, when y'all got started? We ain't had but about $200 when we started. 180 of that was... was Turn it hardest. <laughs> what what the way y'all get the nerve to start a national organization? First of all, we named it national when we wasn't even Harlem. Why? But somewhere I read that if you speak to it with faith, God will make it happen. We came up to PS 175, started National Action Network. We didn't have members of two blocks down. But 31 years later, we're in 121 cities. We spoke and God made it happen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, then, how y'all be able to raise several million dollars a year unrestricted? Because if you cast your bread on the water, yes, he promised he'd return it unto you. Oh, yeah. I grew up learning. I didn't go to Wharton School of Business. Yes, but I went to Washington Temple said, you make one step, yes, sir. he'll make two. Oh, yeah. I had the faith if you open up the fish's mouth, yes, he put it in the fish's mouth. You ain't got no faith, you preach faith. Mm. 
but you won't fund it. I believe that God will make a way if you just do his will. That's why Christmas has a special meaning for me. Let me also say this and I'll let you go. Here's the heart of my Christmas message. There is a rumor, Malcolm Bird, that we need to put to rest. There's a rumor that says that the slave master and the European world is who gave us Jesus. I won't get to some of my intellectual Ungawa brothers. That, you know, they gave us Jesus. It's white man's religion. I don't know why y'all celebrating that white man's religion. But I want you, first of all, to go back and study history. St. Mark brought the story of Jesus to Africa, who was one of the original disciples. The first Christian state was the state of Ethiopia. The Ethiopian Coptic Church started in 3 AD before you ever heard of Roman Christianity. So this is not a white man or no other man's religion. They didn't have to introduce us to Jesus. We already knew him. Not only do we know Jesus and it came through North Africa. Don't forget when Jesus was a child and Herod who was the governor Appointed by the Romans mm -hmm. to keep the children of Israel or the Hebrews in line. Said the way to stop the rise of a Messiah, the rise of a troublemaker, kill the newborn babies. The angel said you better, to Joseph, said you better flee. Yes, Joseph took Mary and the baby and fled into North Africa in the Egypt. That's where Jesus grew up. Right. Oh. Ain't no white man's religion. Some white man told you it was his religion. <laughs> Look at his story. Malcolm Bird talked about it, right? It's the first of all, if you believe, you that are believers of Christ, and I am. I don't pop that. Some of y'all talk, well, that's how they raised me. No, no, no. I was raised that way, but then I believe it for myself. Yes, sir. I don't apologize. Oh, yes. You shame the God, he shame of you. Yes, sir. I proclaim it in public, that's why he blessed me in public. Yes, that's why some of y'all can't keep a boyfriend. That's your boyfriend. Where well, we go out sometime. If they don't want to claim you, drop them. I wouldn't have a God I wouldn't proclaim. I wouldn't have a Savior that I wouldn't say he saved me. Look at the story Mount Bird said. One, he was born homeless. No room in the inn. Born of a parents that wasn't clear whether they was married or not. Listen here. Born under question. Born under oppression. Where the Romans had Herod overseeing occupied land. Why would God, who made the heavens and the earth, why would God, who created all things, why would God, who set the rules of the universe and made the laws of everything from gravity across, why would God send his son into that condition? What I just outlined, homeless, under occupation, question of, of his parentage in terms of their marital status. Why would God do all that to his son? Maybe God was sending an eternal message. I hear you. 
to let you know I don't care how low they bring you. Yes, sir. You are still mine. Yes, sir. And I can take you from nothing yes, and do something with you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't care what they say you're not. They said it about my son. Brought my son up and brought him on charges. Mm. Sentenced him to death. Yeah. Hung him on a cross. Yeah. But they can kill you, but they cannot destroy you. Yeah. The story of Jesus is the story of taking nothing and making something happen. Yeah. Taking the rejected and make it accepted. Yeah. Taking the crucified and make the resurrection. You didn't introduce me to Jesus. I lived the Jesus story. Oh, that's <laughs> Jesus was not something that somebody conjured up. Yeah. Jesus was something that God sent to say, if you believe in him, yes. say John 14, believe it in me. If you see me, you've seen the Father. Mm. So that's why we can identify with Jesus, because Jesus identified with us. Yes. Yes. He didn't come in a palace. Yeah. He didn't come in a mansion. Yes. He didn't come in, uh, inheriting royalty came from a broken situation and took all they had and rose up anyhow. And that's why Christmas is special. That's why the birth of Jesus is special. I was reading this morning in the New York Times that they were, the, the, this sister wrote an uh, op-ed talking about how she didn't know that certain gospel black hymns were written by whites. This, this guy, Robert McGimsey uh, wrote this hymn in 1934, Sweet Little Jesus Boy, Born a Manger. We didn't know who you were. Well, that's true. They didn't know who he was because some of them was born with privilege. Yes, sir. They didn't know who he was. Some of them was born knowing three and four generations who they came from. They didn't know who he was, Stephen Marshall, because some of them never had to want for nothing. They always had room in the end for them. Right, right. But I knew who he was. I knew because I've been homeless. I've been down. I've been castigated. Christmas is for those that are downtrodden. Yes, Christmas is for those that have been crucified. Christmas is for those that have been marginalized. Oh, yeah. Christmas is for those that have been rejected, that can stand up and say joy to the world. Yes, sir. Y'all thought y'all put me down. I'm going to bounce back anyhow. Yeah. Joy to the world. Yes, sir. You call me an ex-convict, but I'm just a pre-reorganizer and a re-manifestation yes, of what God did. Joy to the world. Oh. You locked me up under false pretenses and called me a rapist and a beater. But 33 years later, in the biggest park in the world, you got a gate with my name on it. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let us, let us, let us receive a king. I don't need Santa Claus to show up. Jesus showed up. When mama was scrubbing floors, Santa Claus didn't help her. When mama was standing on the welfare check line, didn't no reindeers come down? But there was a Jesus that heard mama's prayers. There was a Jesus that took that cleaning rag out of hand. There was a Jesus that turned that welfare check into a way to make it. God will make a way. I don't care what y'all call it. I'm going to celebrate Christmas. I'm going to celebrate that baby born in a manger. But he knew my name. He walks with me. I don't need no white man to tell me about Jesus. He talks with me. He tells me that I'm his own. 
I come to the house of justice, say happy birthday, Jesus. Sometimes it's been just me and you. Happy birthday, Jesus. You helped me in the time of trouble. You've been my help. When I was in trouble, you've been my company. When I was lonely, you've been my friend. When I was by myself, you've been my lawyer in the courtroom, my doctor in my sick bed. Happy birthday, Jesus. Happy birthday, Jesus. Happy birthday, Jesus. Joy. Joy. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let earth receive this king. Joy. It's a liberation day. It's a celebration day. This ain't about what you bought. This is about who took you and gave you the victory anyhow. Joy to the world. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive the King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven. someone here today, you come to the rallies every Saturday, you listen to us on radio live or watch us on Impact Television, but never joined the National Action Network, never became a registered member. I would not let this year end without being a registered member of National Action Network. If you're here and not a member, no better time to join than right now. Just come right down to me and we'll sign you up this morning. You that are watching us through our media platforms or listening on radio, you can call and join on the air, on the phone rather, at 1-877-626-4651, one 626 
626-4651. Come on, if you want to join, come on like this, brothers. Come on, come on to me. Everybody sing. Everybody sing. Everybody sing. set up to start feeding people, but I talked about earlier in the uh, broadcast about uh, the Central Park Five that are the exonerated five, and uh, Kerry Weiss is here every week. Stand up, Kerry. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and he worked here for, come on up, he worked here for three years when he got out. And uh, he's a member of the organization. I just got a note, too, that one of the others are here. Uh, Youssef Salam is in the house. And uh, Youssef wanted to thank the people coming out. I, uh, come up, Youssef, stand up over here. I think he running for something. He ain't told me, so I ain't announced it to him to tell me. But uh, uh, I think, give him a hand. I think it was monumental to have that gate named after them. And one of the things, Curry, that I want to see them do is just like we go to Selma and uh, go across that Edmund Pettus Bridge every year, remembering the march. Curry, I want us to go to that gate every year and remember what happened up north. These are the Scottsboro boys of now. And we should not let our children, I want my grandson to grow up and know what they did to the Central Park Five, because that represented and Eric, yo, yo, come on, Kara, say something to the folk on this week, and then I'm going to put you up. No, this because it's been y'all's week, and y'all come to the community to thank us. So Word is here, salute and thank you, New York. That's what I'm going to say. All right. That's what I'm going to say. Yousef. Listen, I want to thank you, but more importantly, I got to thank this young man right here. Because see, when God puts people in your life, it is the, it is the thing that undergirds everything. I remember years ago, Corey Wise posted a great post on social media. He said his name was not on the list. And that's true. But sometimes even if your name is not on the list, like he said, you gotta go anyway. Amen. And if it wasn't for him, right. these beautiful things that happened wouldn't be possible. Right. Because Corey was still in the prison when the young man found religion and saw Corey and said, I gotta tell the truth. So even though Corey's name wasn't on the list, he came, he came 33 years ago to have my back, to make sure I was safe. And 13 years later, he's the one who became the magic key that led us all out of the hell that we were experiencing. So 
I said this before, but I just want to really be succinct by saying, you know, I always think about the Central Park Jogger case yeah. and how tragic it was, but it's actually a love story between God and his people. Come on. And on this day, I want to say that it's a story of a criminal system of injustice yeah. placed on trial in order to produce a miracle in modern time. It's a story of a people who were buried alive and forgotten. The system forgot we all are seeking. And instead of a social death, we were able to emerge like the phoenix from the ashes. Yes. Because as they put out the fire to consume, as they built the fire rather to consume us, they forgot the owner of the heat. So I thank you. Listen, Sharpton's been with us since before it was popular. Y'all know. And for him to have this momentous space in the world, the National Action Network, for him to be able to have a space. They didn't give Corey any services when he came out of prison. The post-traumatic stress, as they call it, but post-traumatic slave, not for Corey, but the stress of a person who was persecuted under the war of systemic issues. They just kicked him out in hope that he would return to become part of the oil of the machinery yes, that consumes us. But look at him today. Look at us, we're here. You know, a good friend of mine said, thank God we don't look like what we've been through. We're going to keep on rising. And I just want to say thank you again. Thank you to my brother, Corey. I'm part of the Harlem community now. I got residency here because I had to be back. I had to come back, man. And, you know, everywhere else is uh, off Broadway. <laughs> but New York is Broadway. Sharpton said, tell them what I'm going to do. Well, you know, I mean, there's a murmur out there that I might be running for city council. All right. Central Hall, 9th District. And I'm not a politician. I'm part of you, but I've always said that those who have been closest to the problem should have a seat at the table. And it shouldn't be politics, but it should be real politics. It should be people who are going to be the voice of those whose voices have been turned down, who is going to represent correctly and make sure. Because over and above our word, is that day we will all be held accountable before our Lord. We don't want to be lacking and wanting. And on that scale of balance, we want, oh my goodness, can I go back and just, we got to make sure that we are people who we say we are and keep on moving forward because the people are behind us. So thank you. Curry Weiss and Yusef Salam. And you, you heard Yusef tell the story of him and Curry, and, and th this is history for you to witness. And we're glad that they came here. Now, you know, Yusef, like you said, I was with y'all when it wasn't popular, and I was telling Ashley, my younger daughter, last night, but I would like for Chris as a hat with a red velvet <laughs> and, and you know, God just sent the hat right in the right <laughs> Give them a hand. Perry White. Yusef Salah. <laughs> All right. I'm going to raise our offering. I want to move quickly so we can set up. I don't want everybody to leave. We're going to set up. We want y'all, to you that are helping us serve, you that are going to eat with us. We got enough for everybody. We got people coming from the shelters. We have some of our seniors coming. <laughs> Katrina Jefferson done a wonderful job with the staff here. <laughs> Sister Word and all of them here have done a wonderful job to set us up. We did Thanksgiving and now uh, dealing with
Christmas. So we're going to feed everybody in about 40 minutes, spend Christmas together. And then y'all go to your church tomorrow. If you ain't got a church, go to Mother A.M.E. Zion. Real bird will be. Alan Williams, we're very happy to have you join. We are very, very, very happy that you've become a part of this justice family. We want you, they're going to give you orientation of the different committees we have. We want you to work where you're comfortable, or you may have ideas we haven't thought of and can form your own committee. Work with us. You are now a full fledged member of this organization. Face the audience and give them a big hand. And welcome him, welcome him, welcome him to the National Action Network. All right, we're going to sing and then dismiss. We're not going to fist bump today, I'm going to fist bump with you as we feed. I want to get everybody so they can arrange, rearrange the room and start in 30 minutes. And uh, that's Keith Wright's son, that is the campaign. Glad to see him. Uh, so let us all stand again. You that want to fist bump with me, just help us feed. You can fist bump while I be filling these plates in about 30 minutes. All right. Oh, man. Saying grace. Oh Let's set up. Wow. 